heat-affected zone to work it down at cold temperatures, I've got to control my heat input. And if this one over here, I can weld it any way I want to. And have big old brains, it don't matter. So I got to weld them different, even though they're the same stuff. And you say, well, they can't be the same stuff, Peter. I don't believe you. Well, most of you had a grandma. And many of you got to go eat turkey dinner with her before she passed on. And you remember, she made them big things of cornbread, like the dressing, turkey dressing. And she had this big old bowl, she mixed that homemade stuff up in, and she poured one black skillet full, the second black skillet full, out of the same bowl, put them in the same oven at the same time, one on the top shelf, one on the middle. Got busy with the grandkids, sniffing, and yep, it smells pretty good, goes in, pokes the one on top, usually got done first, took it out, put it on top. Went back to the bathroom, must have been a runny poo in the youngest diapers. In there too long, come back out and black smoke coming out of the kitchen. Fan that thing around, pull it out, set it on top. It's black on top. Are they going to taste the same? Well, yeah, they're the same stuff. Well, no, they ain't going to taste the same, are Because they cook different one part. And that's what happens here. They take them to the same melting temperature. But one of them is made to cool faster than the other. The 333 is made to cool faster so the grains are smaller and the 106 can cool slow and the grains like to grow. They like to get big if you let them cool slow. So that's the difference in them. Okay? Now, we got alloy. And we add elements to change mechanical or physical properties. And we do it two different ways. Our the alloy folks do it two different ways. Interstitial is where we will sneak in some ingredients between the grains of the iron. Like atom can be interstitially alloyed in steel up to 0.03%. And then we can take one of them iron ones out and put a nickel one in. That's called substitution. But looking first at the interstitial, up in the purple, with a little interstitial, say that's carbon between the iron, doesn't look like it did anything. But really, if you look down here, it made it uncomfortable and it squiggled those, those uh, stretch planes there. And, or slip planes, I should say. It's kind of like getting a little bit of rock in your boot, about the size of a piece of rice with sharp edges on it. Compared to us, it ain't very big. But it will cause us to take that boot and shoe off, pull that off, and protect that little guy out and look at him and think, how could that little bitty guy hurt me so bad? But he ain't bad as a yellow jacket. How many of you can let him land right there and just leave him alone? I can. I've done it many times. But you, you can't look at him. You do that, he's bit. Because he, he's up there like that, he's ready to pop you with that stick. Just wait, freeze, and he'll leave. And I, one day after metallurgy class, I was out at the shed out there and moving some stuff around and got into a guinea wolf's nest. Man, them things flew up everywhere. And there was a car leaving when, when that happened, and they saw me do this. And them things were crawling on my hand, they crawling on my ear and my hair. And I stayed there long, and they all left. Next day they asked me, did you get bit? No. And my middle son, David, can do it too. He called me one day, then I can do it too. So I started up a wall's nest the other day, and I froze like you said, and they, you're right, they will leave. Well, he said, what I'm talking about though is a little bitty thing. It ain't very big, and that can hurt you bad. When I was mowing yards for people, they Yellow jackets would build nests in the ground. I would push them all over. They'd suck them out. They'd eat me up. And I would have to stop right there and go put the more in the truck and go home and go to the bed. And I thought I was dying. Them things put me down for the rest of the day. I had to go back up there, find that hole, pour gas down in it, and hopefully kill them rascals. So they're bad. 
Now, how many of you have heard having a memory like an elephant? Well, you know where they get that. Not the, I'm not talking about the wild elephant. I'm talking about an elephant that will be in a zoo. And she has a baby. And they take a little chain that you would swing your kids in, a little bit of chain, put a shock around that baby's foot, drive a stake, or if you're South Mississippi, call it a stub. You drive a stub in the ground over there, and that elephant's trying to get to his mama's milk, and he pulls, and he pulls, and he pulls, until blood is running from around that chakra. And he'll wake up tomorrow hungry, and he'll do it. Oh, man, he remembers that pain. And it is a known fact that that elephant will grow to the huge size that they can get and they will leave him stake every day to that same little bitty chain with that same little bitty stake and he will not pull it out. He will die in a tent fire because he knows, he remembers the pain, he knows he can't pull it out. And he'll die. Well, I don't want a memory like that. Well, let me tell you something about what the old Elephant ain't been talking about, or a yellow jacket. And can you imagine two of them flying up here and, and seeing an elephant stand out there at the fence of the zoo eating some peanuts? And one of the yellow jackets said, What's this? And God is a male elephant. This little yellow takes a beeline to the backside of it, dodges that swinging tail, flies right up there, and pops that elephant in a tender spot. A loud bellow comes out of that huge mouth and he smashes the fence down and will crush your new Mercedes smooth to the dirt as he leaves. And how could that be? This little thing ain't that big and he's tons. A little bitty thing matter. That's why the code says clean it. Some of these little bitty things wind up being in there and they wind up being discontinuities that we see. But some of these little bitty things in there don't be seen by any NDE, but they can cause metallurgical changes and loss of strength, productivity, etc. So, substitutional, we put a different one in there. And it, and the old guy kind of like looks at that and says, well, we ain't never seen nobody dressed like you before. And that squiggles the lines again. And it gives whatever property. And there's books this thick on this subject. There are smart people that do this alloying and making all this stuff up. And that's what they study. They're good at all that. And there's hundreds, if not thousands, of materials used around the world, all kind of different alloys used for special applications. And everybody's is better than the last one invented. Now, microstructures. Things we've got to look at under a microscope. And they ask the question of there are failures really the result of crystallized metal. No. Metals, when they get solid, are crystals. So we got rid of that already. So metals are composed of grains or crystals. They're not very big. They're separated by grain boundaries, and there are those different phases in those grains. Now here is the microstructure of pure iron. The only thing I know that's pure iron is tie wire and those old cores that used to be in the welding machine. Everything else is steel, a little bit of iron in it, a little bit of, well, a little bit of carbon in the iron. So this is just pure iron. The white grains are ferrite iron. And the grain boundaries are the little black lines that squiggle around in there. And the dark blobs are little particles that came off the polishing and grinding rock. They polished that until you could, it was mirror bright. Literally, you could pick your teeth, pick stuff out of your eyeball looking in that piece of iron. And then they poured a reagent or an acid on it and they etched it, and then they washed it with clean water, and they shone bright lights on it, and blew it up 1,500 or 2,000 times, and took that picture. The next piece will look similar, it won't be exact, but that's how it goes. Here is an iron face diagram, a scary looking fly, but don't worry, we all will be dealing with this much of it. 
Uh, and that's a, we have an A1 line, which is the bottom of that triangle, and an A3 line, which is the hypotenuse of this right triangle here. And what we talked about earlier, we saw that at 1,333 degrees here, iron transformed from BCC to FCC. And 1,333 is, if I had, and down here on the bottom, this, these numbers here are carbon percent. When a iron has 0.8 carbon, that's the 1,333 guy line right there at 0.8 carbon. Guys, we don't weld on anything unless it's cast iron that's got that much carbon. The B31-3 codes won't let us use material that's got more than 0.35 in them. So we're way over here, some not above zero, but we're somewhere in the middle here at the most. 4140 would be halfway across, and that's 160,000 tinsel. So we're actually less than that. And that A3 line, if you look at it, if it had zero carbon, it had to go all the way to 1,666 degrees Fahrenheit to transform from BCC to FCC. So everything we well on got some carbon in it. So that A3 line up there is going to be the temperature that when we stress relieve materials, we never exceed that temperature of that A3 line. And most of you, some of you may have done stress relieving. I've seen that. And that ever carbon steel, 11 to 1200, some of the chrome mollies, maybe 1200 up to almost 1300. So they want to get as close to that a3 line as they can without causing it to metamorphosize, change from FC, BCC to FCC. They just want to relax it. But that's the line that governs stress relieving. And that's all we need to think about on that. The rest of that stuff, you don't need to, you, if you want to, you remember this is hypoectatoid and more carbon makes it hyper. Like more chocolate makes in grand youngers more hyper when they go back home. See, that's how you can relate some of that stuff. But look, this is a scary looking thing, but it ain't too bad. What's ferrite? It's iron. Sometimes called alpha iron or just FE. And we don't use it. We got to put something with it to make it strong. By itself, without any carbon in it, it's about 30,000 strong. That's why tie wire is easy to bend and wear out and so forth. And now cementite, what is that? Well, it's just a mixture of three atoms of iron hooked onto one atom of carbon. We call that iron carbide. So steel then is ferrite and cementite. That's what it is. Just plain 836 steel. Oh yeah, they put a little uh, silicon in it, and that's only in there just in case some oxygen comes sneaking in that well puddle, and that silicon is to kill it. And oh yeah, they put a little manganese in there, and that's just to whoop up on the sulfur. That's those two guys, but the, the thing that makes it strong is that little bit of carbon, and that makes steel. Now, we can take that piece of steel, put it in an oven, Bring it up above the 1,333 degree temperature, and we can say now it is austenitic, or you can call it austenite if you want to. Guess what? No matter, you can't get in there and use it for nothing anyway. You can't be welding on it. It's up in that oven, 1,700 degree. But it's got to come out. And when it comes out, it can come out if I shut the oven off and let the oven cool back down real slow and then take it out after it cools and wipe me a piece out and blow it up under microscope that would be called pearlite slow cooling gives me a layer that looks like a thumbprint print under microscope the next one if i had it in that oven and i just drug it out of the oven and let it cool outside in steel air It'll cool a little faster, and then when I chop a piece of all it off, polish it up, blow it up under a microscope, it kind of looks like a few limbs and some charcoal that was burnt in the grill to me. And that's called bainite. 
But if we yank it out of that oven while it's really hot, chuck it in the water, we get marten sight. And it looks like pine straw in your wife's rose bushes. And you can tell, you better not hit it with a hammer because there'll be in more than one piece. And when it's marked, so I can't use it till I go back and put it back in the oven and warm it back up and give it some ductility. So Linda put this together for us to show just what I mentioned. We got three plates, A, B, and C. But guys, they came off the same mother plate. We cut them into three pieces. It was 20 feet long. We cut them in equal length pieces and named them A, B, and C. And put all, same plate, same material, same stuff, put them in the oven all at one time and run that oven up above the transformation temperature, maybe to 1,700 degrees. There they went. Now, we're gonna take them out. Steel plate A, let's see what kind of treatment it did. We took it out of the oven after it sat in there a spell and it cooled in steel air and we did a tensile test on it, and a tensile test looks like a dog bone, this guy here. Uh, and the tensile strength of that bar after we did that process called normalizing came up to 85,000 pounds per square inch. The next bar, let's see, steel plate B came out, and then it was rapidly cooled, quenched, and put it back in the oven and tempered, and did another bar like it, and look, the strength of that one, same material, grew up to 120,000. And the one that stayed in the oven and cooled, when the oven cooled, that's called annealing, it's the, the uh, softest of all of them, did another tensile bar, and it tested at 75,000. And it's the same material heated to the same temperature, held for the same length of time, but cooled three different ways. And that drives the strength all the way from 75 to 100. That's 45,000 difference in tensile strength. And it could have been a little bit higher had they uh, tempered that one a little bit lower temperature, the strength might have been climbed higher. And you say, well, what's that got to do with welding? Everything. When we weld, we already know we're going, we're going to go through those same temperatures. We got to melt it, we got to get it over 2700 degrees. Well, everything doesn't melt, but everything melts out to that, that uh, weld interface. All that melted, but past the well interface now becomes the heat of vapor zone, and yeah, it saw higher than 1,333 degrees. And depending on whether we preheated it or poured the coal to it, then it cooled either slow, medium, or fast. And it's going to react the same way that these pieces react. And that, my friend, is old ex John McCain would say. That's why we need to be following the welding procedure specification to make sure it's going to be okay. So when we anneal something, put it in the furnace and let the furnace cool down slow. That's called annealing. And that creates perlite, which is the softest condition that you can find. And the next one, we put it in that same furnace at the same time, and we pull it out of the furnace while it's hot and let it cool outside, not in the wind, not don't blow on it, don't do anything to it, it's still air. And that's called bainite. And we do the third one, we yank it out of the oven while it's hot, put it in some medium to cool it, water, whatever, and it creates martensite, and that's the hardest it can be. Now, over the years, people would ask me, how do we remember all that? Well, it was 2019 when I came up with this pretty hokey way. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not happy with it, but it's the best thing I've come up with yet. Okay, so I'm going to show you this. And if it helps, okay, and if you come up with a better way, tell me and I'll give you credit for it. 
Uh, I look up here and I say, well, perlite is pretty solid. And martensite is mighty hard. And bainite is between. Hard and soft. That helps? Have at it. If it don't, if you want to take a picture, you don't write that down, you can. But I'm still working on a way to help people associate these different things together so that they'll hang with you. But right now, that's the best I've got. Okay? Perlite, pretty soft, martensite, mighty hard, and bainite is between being pretty soft and mighty hard. And I get, I kneel it, I leave it in the furnace, normalize it, I cool it in still air, and quench it, I put it in some medium, drunk straight from the furnace while it's really hot. Now, that's the lamellar appearance of perlite. To me, that looks like a thumb print. The white in there is the ferrite, and the dark is cementite. Remember, cementite is a mixture of iron and carbon. That's where the black comes in. Blown up 1,500 times. Well, this is a stretch, but to me, I've seen charcoal with a few sticks that I had in it to look kind of like bainite. And then, yep, that looks like pine needles to me. And we get that when we rapidly cool it. And that rapid cooling might be a scooter bead fitting up undercut when I should have had a minimum preheat of 200 and I didn't do any. And that's what happened to that heat affected zone. And hardness flies up and the likelihood of cracking is going to fly sore as well. Well, temporary. Let's look. Restores ductility and toughness and reduces uh, the strength and hardness. This is a 12.2 chrome alloy. And let's just do us a welding procedure, okay? We'll do us a, we'll do it on a back and strap here. And this ingot or slab, let's say it's a slab, came in and the guy wants to qualify a welding procedure on it, but when it comes in, he doesn't like the properties. It comes in with 150 um, thousand tensile strength and 140 thousand yield strength and a Bernal harness over here of 300. And he said, no, that's too hard. We, we, we need to send that to the heat treater and let's reduce this. What he wants it reduced to is about 140 thousand tensile and 130 yield. Well, he tells the heat trigger what he wants and shows him what the chemistry is. The heat trigger got the books and he said, okay, I know what to do. We're going to heat it and we're going to quench it and I'm going to temper it at 500. Okay? And that's going to give him his 140 and his 130. And that's what he does and that's what he's got. And now these materials come back to the shop reduced in strength and hardness and we're going to weld up a test coupon for procedure qualification. And so it's a plate. They say it's probably an inch and a half thick. thing costs a lot of money. And since it's a quenched and tempered material, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to make sure I don't get it this hot. If I get that thing over that 500, I'm going to lose that strength that I need. So what I'm going to have to do is tell these welders, look, whatever you do, don't put more heat into it. And I'm just going to use that 55,000 joules inch that, that I read so many years ago, joules per inch. 55,000, I don't know if you can read that or not. Probably not. 55,000. So that means I'm going to have to run small shrinker beads. And I'm going to have to have a preheat on that of at least 150. And i got to tell him, whatever you do, don't get it. I don't want to even approach that. So I'm going to say don't get it more than 450. And that's pretty dangerous getting it that hot. So I got to, those are my parameters. So they start welding and they put these beads in there and they realize, man, it's going to, we ain't going to get through. And they think, oh, we got a date tonight. Not with each other. 
But they got a date. Two guys, they got a date with some women somewhere later. So they got to hurry up. The big welding guy knows where the big rods are. So they go get the big rods. Whoa! Big old baby. Big old baby. And, and then they said, well, we better cap it with stringers because Taylor told us we better do that. So they put the stringers on top to hide what they did from whoever. But they can't hide what's going to happen. They put that much energy in it, and look, it's going to dry that up at least another 100 degrees. And when I test that thing, my tensile strength is going to fall from 140 to 120. And my yield strength goes from 130 down to 100. I lost 30,000 yield and 20,000 tensile because them hard-headed people thought it didn't matter. They could just play like they did it, like I asked them to do it. And that's where you will find the truth about it. Now, we cut that thing open and polish it and look at it. I wouldn't even test it because I know what's going to happen. It's science. If I put too much heat in it, we just talk about what happens when we do that. When we put too much heat and let it cold and slow, it gets softer. Put the same amount of heat, but cool it faster. We don't have that problem. So anyway, uh, that's that's why we do welding procedures, and that's why we follow the welding procedures. Because if we don't follow them, we're going to take the properties of that material that they spend a lot of money to get. We're going to take them away. Where it's going to be in that heat affected zone. But that heat affected zone. As you say it, that heat effect is only out here. The, if he welded with the right filler metals, the weld is okay, and everything from here out is okay. But it's that one little eighth of an inch heat effect zone that they just destroyed by doing that. Didn't, didn't mess the weld up. Didn't rest the base. Rest of the base. But it's that chain. I remember that chain we drew the other day. It's got five links in it. It's got a base metal. It's got a base metal. It's got a heat effect that's on on both sides and a weld in the middle. And my daddy told me we were trying to build a pen to put old Hank the bull in. He got off the tractor with no muffler and it was running loud. And he said, boy, do you know a chain breaks its weakest link? I thought it was a trick question. I said, no, sir. He said, no, it does. End of story. This ain't nothing else. He was training me for metallurgy. I didn't know it. <laughs> Bless his heart. He was 92 when he passed away. And then I went to see him in the hospital. Uh, or maybe it was, he was in the rest home. He didn't stay for two months. He, he wanted to go. And I thought about that. And I said, Daddy, do you remember asking me when I was a kid, did I know that a chain breaks in a weakest link? No, but it does. <laughs> and I feel like I never told me nothing there. But I remember that, and I associated it with welding, and it's been good. And, and, and Mama taught me the same thing about the penetration and, and uh, uh, well puddles when I messed up her water hose one time, but I, well, I'll tell you that story right now.